Hey guys, I've talked about the Dutch bucket hydroponics quite a bit in the past and showed how I put it together, how productive it was, how easy it was to work with. Got a couple other things I want to talk about today in regard to these buckets and the things that I'm doing. And right now you can see how many tomatoes on here. Uh, one thing that you notice missing is a lot of the foliage. I got a situation in here with blight. Uh, last fall I had leaf mold and it just jumped all over the plants in a hurry and I made the decision last year to come in here and aggressively prune everything up and get those infected leaves off and try to get caught up and eventually I did and the tomatoes turned out just fine. What has happened here is I had a little bit of blight and I thought I had it under control in the last four or five days once the temperatures really escalated and I've got a lot more uh, ventilation blowing through here. Uh, this stuff just spread like crazy so I have pruned everything up, hauled off about two uh, big trash bags of leaves out of here to try to get back control of this situation. It's tough when you're dealing with the, the heat inside of a greenhouse and when you get a fungal issue it just spreads like wildfire so I'll do the best I can with what I got to work with. I get asked right often what size reservoir do you need based on the number of buckets and I don't know that there is a set size uh, preferably I think a two gallons for every bucket that you have I think would be pretty good. It'd be certainly a good start. I've got a 27 gallon right here for almost uh, 20 buckets so I'm not in the two to one ratio nowhere near. So that's why I haven't been running this on a timer. I come out here three times a day, plug the pump up, let it run for a while and then uh, unplug it and go on about my business. I was not comfortable with putting it on a timer and having this thing uh, pumped down when I wasn't uh, paying attention to it and end up burning up the pump. So what I have done to uh, rectify that situation is I've got a 55 gallon drum right here, painted white, did not want anything to try to heat this water up in the summertime. Put a quarter turn valve on it, little uh, plastic tubing right here, run it into a float valve. These are the ones similar to like Larry Hall was using on his uh, uh, gutter system. You can get them at some of the hydroponic stores. You can get them on Amazon. I think I ordered that one from a hydro store somewhere. And they work extremely well. As the water levels goes down, this valve will open up and release the water. And then once it comes back up, it'll shut off. So instead of having, you know, 20 gallons of water to deal with, I've actually got another 50 in here. So that'd be like 70 gallons. And I can now be comfortable with putting this on a timer and not having to worry about it. This is the type of timer that I'm using. It's a Leviton number LT112 that I found on Amazon. Works out pretty good. It's digital. Uh, the only thing is the battery that's in it is not very good and as soon as your power goes out you're going to have to go back and reset it. But I've got mine set for three times a day. We're going from uh, 7 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and then 7 o'clock in the evening and doing 30 minutes each time. Now that I've got this big barrel hooked up to it I'm very comfortable with leaving it set on a timer. Something you might want to consider is a filter bag for the pump that's in the reservoir, especially if you're running perlite and you've got maybe some little bitty particles coming back uh, with the strainers in the buckets that I have, that's not too big of an issue, but certainly it doesn't hurt to put a bag like this around your pump and prevent anything from getting up in there. It just ties right around here and what it will do, it will filter out anything on the side and keep it from being sucked up into the pump. Down here on this end, you see I've got four empty spaces there where I have taken the plants out. What I decided I was going to do was grow the open pollinated version of Big Beef. That's one of my favorite tomatoes. And there was a version that was supposed to have been dehybridized. Open pollinated would be very comparable to the uh, original Big Beef hybrid. So I figured maybe if I can grow it out, it does decent. I'll be able to save seed from Big Beef and kind of get away from the hybrid deal. And one of the questions somebody asked when I was doing it was, how do you think it will hold up as far as uh, disease stuff goes? The Big Beef is supposed to be fairly disease resistant. Uh, this open pollinated version, how would it do? I'll tell you how it did. It didn't do diddly squat. These plants, when they first started off, looked extremely good. And for whatever reason, in about a week's time, they just immediately turned and went straight downhill uh, they just look absolutely horrendous, so I made the decision to get them out of here. Something else you notice right here on the end, I have two plants that have a fair amount of foliage on them. Lots of uh, tomatoes up in there, although some of them are kind of a funky looking shape. This is a Cherokee Purple, a very well-known heirloom. A lot of people 
when I was uh, reading comments and things, they always spoke very highly of Cherokee purple. Supposedly very good eating, so I figured I would try it and see what the fuss was about. And I'm finding something very unique about it in that the big beef hybrids that I have in here, uh, they are not doing so well in terms of the blight, whereas this Cherokee purple right here is just going right along and uh, acting like it's no big deal. But right now, I am highly impressed with these uh, Cherokee purples. Not because of the quality of the fruit, but just because of the strength and ability of them to withstand the blight. When I say I wasn't overly impressed with the fruit, this is why. This is basically a mega bloom on a Cherokee purple. And you see how big this tomato is. It will probably end up weighing the most of any tomato I've ever had. But my goodness, she is ugly. I mean, shaped all the way around here. You can actually almost see through the middle here. So I'll let it keep on growing and we'll see how big and uh, heavy it actually gets. And when it comes time to eat it, uh, I just take my knife and I'll cut around it and I'll cut them big chunks off. And by the time it gets in the salad, it won't know whether it came from an ugly tomato or one that was perfectly round. When I first started my Dutch buckets, I put lids on everything. And certainly if you're going to do it outside and you don't want to have rain in it, that'd probably be a good idea. But inside in the greenhouses, uh, a lot of the commercial growers, they don't use a lid on them. They just leave them wide open and what they do is they have a long uh, dripper that sticks down in the perlite and sends the water down, I guess, two or three inches below the surface. That way you don't get algae growing up on top. So to kind of duplicate that, what I did was take a piece of PVC pipe. This is about six inch pipe. Just stick it down in here, pull it back a little bit because the perlite will pack in the end. And I don't have a dripper on here. I leave these things free flowing and I just stick this on down in here. And what it will do is it will uh, release the fluid two or three inches below the surface and keep the top from getting so much algae on it. When I do my setup outside, I'm definitely going to have to put lids on them. But if you're inside a greenhouse and you don't have the wind and stuff to contend with and blowing your perlite around, uh, you don't necessarily have to have a lid on the bucket. Last year when I was looking at getting started with the Dutch buckets, I watched a lot of YouTube videos, uh, preferably the commercial operations because I wanted to see how the big growers were doing it and then be able to scale it down to size. But there were a lot of uh, DIY folks I watched and the majority of them, they just made some videos and then they were no longer making anymore so I could just watch it and I couldn't follow up on it. Uh, right now, what I have done is tried to, once I start a process, keep it going and let people learn from my mistakes. But this is how I choose to do things. This is the uh, components and parts that I work with. There's a lot of different ways to do Dutch buckets as far as your tubing and fittings and all that kind of stuff. And there's a guy up in Canada, actually a British Columbia way out there on the west coast. Uh, his name is Brock. His YouTube channel is Mean Shoes. He's a very likable gentleman. Got a really nice setup in his greenhouses uh, where he's got the Dutch buckets where he does tomatoes, peppers, and he also has done cucumbers in there with a pretty good success. So I'll put a link somewhere up here and down below. So if you're interested in Dutch buckets, you can go check out Brock. But one of the things he mentioned recently was the, uh, the plastic on the outside where I have chosen to put black plastic to uh, conceal the light, to stop lighting from getting into these uh, thin wall buckets. What he did was use the, uh, the panda plastic, which basically it's black on one side and white on the other. For me, because of the fact the sun is going to be over the top and it's not going to be shining directly on the side, I'm okay with the black plastic. And later in the fall when the sun is way over there and we got cooler temperatures, then I won't mind having the black and you know the sun shining on that side of it. It'll actually be a benefit. But if you're setting this up, in a situation where, like right now, if you're running north-south and you've got the first four or five hours of the day, the sun shining directly on one side, whether you're inside a greenhouse or outside, you probably don't want to put black plastic. You want to use something uh, a lot lighter to keep the side of that bucket from heating up. It's just something else to think about. So I hope that was helpful. Y'all take care, and Lord willing, I'll see you next time. If you found this video to be helpful, informative, entertaining or just downright funny, don't forget to subscribe.